as a spectator, like every Australian feels as though they're along for the ride. But knowing that you've been a part of that tournament as well, being up close and personal with the players and just being in those press conferences, you really feel as though you're living that story with them. Before the tournament, I was a soccer fan, but I'm more of an AFL girl. <laughs> so yeah. just the fact that football's consumed my entire life now and oh, it just feels like you're there with them. Um, you just want to see them do well. G'day guys, coming up on the show today is V Trung. V is a journalism student who's just had the experience of a lifetime volunteering on the FIFA Women's World Cup in Melbourne in media and communications. Today, you're going to hear exactly what it was like for V behind the scenes, plus there's even a little surprise for you regarding her next opportunity in sport as well. So let's go. I started volunteering. It's all about who you know in sport. Am I going to be calling the last 10 seconds of the grand final? You can connect with the interviewer. The hand goes up when they've got to make a decision. Having a network is one of the most important things you can do. I didn't necessarily follow my passion. I followed my curiosity. Once you've worked in sport, there's no going back. And then lo and behold, before I left, I got offered two. Hello and welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast, the ultimate guide to make it in the sports industry. I'm Ryan Walker. Joining me is the African correspondent, Ruben Williams. We are two mates who met at Cricket Australia back in the day and each week we learn how people made it in the sports industry. We tease out their career decisions, their work habits, skills and everything they do that makes them great. All so that you can learn how to get in, get promoted and get thriving in the sports industry. Rubes, the African correspondent, a bit of a different one. But uh, how are you, my friend? G'day, Ryan. I'm terrific. Thank you. How good are the Matildas? I uh, have been watching them from afar. Everywhere I've been recently has had French commentary, so I've just had the pictures to uh, tell me what's going on. But I've been absolutely glued to the TV watching the last couple of weeks. And um, I know you were there in Sydney. I'm keen to get your thoughts on what it was like being at Stadium Australia in just a sec. But... Uh, it was absolutely phenomenal watching from from overseas and just seeing all the social media coverage come through on Instagram. Everyone's stories was about the Matildas. Everything was covering the Matildas. It was just phenomenal to to, mm. to watch. But um, you were in the ground. How was uh, that semi final experience for you? Yeah, it was absolutely unbelievable. I think the, I've, I've never felt being in a sporting event the the buzz a, as much as I did before this game. Like the energy around the stadium, even in Sydney. You know, we, we worked there from the day uh, on the uh, what day was it? The the Wednesday, and um, it was just the city was just alive. Like there was just people everywhere. Everyone's wearing Tilly's kit, um, and then inside the ground, like. They did the pregame really well. That's what I will say. FIFA do a great crowd experience. Like it was something else. Um, and obviously when when they scored the first one, everyone got a little bit flat. But when Sam Kerr hit that thunderbolt from outside the box, like I have not heard a sound like that. Like it was the biggest roar I've ever heard. And everyone was just going absolutely ballistic. It was It was just incredible. Um, such a unique event. Nothing like, It was like nothing I've ever been to before. Um, but I think overall there was just this, just this sense of connection between everybody. Um, it was just – it was so unique that it's like a national team, every single person was behind them. Um, you know, compared to any other major sporting event that I've been to, it just did not compare. It was just so different. So – Super stoked to be able to get there. We obviously didn't get the result that we wanted, but um, it was just a great experience nonetheless. And uh, yeah, it just feels super lucky to, to have been able to go. Mm. It, it just looked absolutely phenomenal how many people c- came together for this. And um, to give to give you a comparison to what it's like at, a, say, previous Men's World Cups, like I've been, to, I went to the Russia World Cup and I went to the Qatar World Cup, and both times I tried to get friends to come with me, and like, oh yeah, maybe, like I don't know, it's a Russia World Cup, what's in, oh, it's in Qatar, like what's it gonna be like? And every single time, like you walk into the stadium, mm-hmm. and it's like the most pressure you've ever felt in your entire life. But pat- particularly in Qatar, like when the Socceroos were playing Denmark, I was like, oh my god, like I've never been to anything bigger than this right now, and you you feel the pressure, yeah. but. The, in a weird way, the atmosphere didn't come with it. 
because you're one of maybe 8,000 yeah. Australians in a stadium of 45 cheering who's actually seriously invested yeah. in it. And I remember getting home from some of those Qatar World Cup matches regarding the Socceroos and looking back at scenes of Fed Square going, oh, my God, like there's 20,000 people jumping up and down, throwing flares at each other, doing everything right now. Like it just looks mm. incredible. And so th- from what I can see, like the FIFA Women's World Cup is like the perfect combination of both. You've got the atmosphere and you've got the intensity and everybody has jumped on it. And I'm really hoping that this means anytime I ask a friend to come with me to the FIFA World Cup in the future, they will say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It was it was genuinely felt like there was 75,000 in there all going for the Aussies. Um, you know, sprinkled with some, some palms in there. Um, there was some around us, but... Um, yeah, no, it, it was just insane. It, it felt like th- genuinely everybody was going for the Tillies. And, uh, yeah, just the sound and atmosphere that came with that was just incredible. So, yeah, oh, I think you'll have a few more mates at the next World Cup, mate. I don't think you'll have a, you'll have a issue. But, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, like, you know, any Matildas game going forward, like, it, it's going to sell out. Like, it's it's changed the whole atmosphere of this. Mm. And, um yeah, it, it, it's just changed the game. Mm. So incredible experience, super lucky. Um, and, yeah, can't can't say much more. It was just one of the best things mm. I've ever been to. Anyway, we've got a big episode. <laughs> and, and it has got that FIFA World, uh, Women's World Cup theme, which is, which is fantastic. So if you don't already, follow us on LinkedIn. And if you want to connect with us and hundreds of other people working in the sports industry, you can become a member of the Sports Grad community. Speaking of our community, Rubes, there's a lot happening at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. One thing kind of tied to the SportsGrad community, which uh, people on LinkedIn may have seen, is a SportsGrad Pro newsletter has just dropped as well, or um, an introduction to a bit of a teaser has dropped. Tomorrow, the first email blast will will go out. And um, so for those people who have uh, entered into the industry, we know there's, you know, over 400 of our members have got jobs in the industry. For those people who are looking to get better at their job, this newsletter is specifically tailored to you. So if you want to get information about, you know, what CEOs, execs, founders, other elite operators in the sports industry do um, that underpins their success, then um, subscribe to this newsletter because this is what will help you progress in your career. In terms of our current community a massive shout out to uh the 33 members who were volunteering on the fifa women's world cup uh we had a job fair with their hr department before the tournament and as a result of that we've had a massive amount of members have the time of their lives and we're super lucky to be able to chat with v one of them very soon but then also a big shout out to uh Sam Hickson, another member, another friend of the show, been on the podcast twice, event manager at Football Australia. He's just had the time of his life uh, helping put on the World Cup from an event management perspective. Uh, Emily Jackson, head of legal at the FIFA Women's World Cup, previous podcast guest. Again, like all of these people are just having the experience of their life, career highlights that they'll never forget for the rest of their life. So Shout out to those guys, like the stuff that they are going through and the content they're putting up on their own little Instagrams or LinkedIn is, um, you know, stuff that all their friends, I'm sure, are jealous of. So well done to you guys. Uh, As always, we've got plenty of events coming up. Speed Networking is happening next week. We had a record turnout in the last one. 39 people just uh, rocked up Mm. to that. Uh, We've got a job fair the week after that. And then meetups are uh, are coming in bulk so if you are keen to get together in person <laughs> there are some serious opportunities right around australia for the next 12 months to uh, to look out for so if you want to stay up to date with what's going on and uh receive a bit of motivation and boost in your inbox every friday then subscribe to the sports grad newsletter sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter is where you can subscribe and there is also a link in the show notes to join Brilliant. Yeah, I, um, I'm super pumped for our meetup calendar to come out, Rubes. Uh, I don't think in our history we've been this organised in terms of planning our events in advance, but soon, I guess, anybody who's tuning in who's been to a meetup, you, you know, you'll be able to experience that and, I guess, know when they're happening a year in advance. You can put them in the calendar straight away and uh, and get involved. So, Super exciting times, and I like how you said in bulk because they're going to come in bulk, and that's a really great way of saying it. (laughs) 
Would you would you would you say the atmosphere is on par with Matilda's games? Yeah, Atmos is the exact same, <laughs> uh, no matter where you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you want if you want the Matilda's experience, uh, come to a sports grab meetup. It's, it's pretty similar. So uh, no, brilliant, mate. We'll have to talk to some Football Australia staff, see who we can get in. Yeah, I, I want whoever does the event prez for Stadium Australia to come in and, and run the show. That'd be that'd be fantastic. Mm. All right, brilliant. We'll um, grab a pen, enjoy this chat with V Trung. Everybody wants to study at one of the top unis in the world for sport. And at Deakin, you can do just that. So don't miss your chance to see what sets them apart at their campus open days this August. Check out the state of the art facilities, hear from their world class academics, meet with current students, and experience the campus vibe that they're famous for. Join thousands of the brightest students who have already registered to attend this unmissable event. Search Deakin Open Day and take your first step towards achieving your ultimate career. The Geelong Open Day is on the 20th of August, 9am to 3pm. And of course, Burwood Open Day is the 27th of August at 9am to 3pm. So check it out now and start your career in sport. V, welcome to the Sports Grade Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. V, it's wonderful to have one of our own members come on the pod every chance we, we get to speak to a member. And wonderful that we get to speak to someone who's just been working on the FIFA Women's World Cup too. I want, I want to ask you straight off the bat, you would have had heaps of people asking you, what was the World Cup like? I'm wondering, what, what are the couple of moments or stories that you share with them each time someone asks? Yeah, well, first I always tell them that there's just so much that goes into it behind the scenes that you don't really understand until you're in behind the scenes and working in the role. I think my highlight, number one, has got to be standing on the pitch for the Australia-Canada match down in mm. Melbourne where we kicked four against the reigning Olympic champions. That was insane. Yeah. Got to stand right at the corner where all the players would run to that side straight away. So if you pause some of the footage and the coverage, you can see like a little girl in orange uniform just standing in the corner. <laughs> That's me. Um, yeah, no, just braving the cold, having to stand out in the pitch for five upwards, six hours. It's just all worth it when you're watching mm. a game on the pitch, like live. Nice. And you're in all the, the media press conferences and everything I saw as well? Yeah, so when you work in media operations and broadcasts, you're basically stationed and split off into different areas. So that could be your presses, mix mm. zone, which is where the press interact with the players. So all the players will have to come through a mix zone after a match. If they don't, they get fined. So yeah. um, they face the journalists there. You just have to mediate all of the journalists, make sure they're not recording all of the legal media stuff. You've got field of play, so rounding up all the photographers as well and the press that are on the pitch. Yeah. And then the media centre, which is where all the accreditation happens. You meet all of the journalists. So met a couple of, I would guess, idols or journalists that I do look up to coming into the centre every day. Nice. You literally had pitch side seats for one of the most important matches in Australian football history. I did. Um, didn't cost me a thing either. So <laughs> free uniform, free meals and got to stand pitch side. Um, I know a lot of people would complain about having to stand that long in the cold, but I mean, it was an Australia match where we won, so <laughs> yeah. can't complain too much. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, your kit's amazing, I heard as well. The little little orange or Balumpas I was kind of calling him the other night, but uh, <laughs> apparently the kit is just unreal. It's probably worth about 500 bucks if you went to go buy that. So It is sponsored by Adidas. Um, we love that. They give you everything, a vest, a parka jacket, shoes as well. Nice. Very good. Yeah, awesome. No, it's great. I, I reckon on the... Uh, on the FIFA broadcast, Ruse, I've been sort of trying to look at, you know, all the f people holding the flag. You're like, you know, who can I see in orange that I can notice as a sports club member? Because we know we've had nearly, I think it's about 40-odd people join the FIFA World Cup, which has been incredible. So it's been cool seeing you all on TV. I'm not sure if I knew it was you at any certain point, but uh, it's super, super cool. Um as a, as a great listener of the show, you would know that we start with some quick fire questions mm. when we do this podcast. So we've got a few here for you and uh, it'll just enable our guests to know uh, you a little bit more. So I'll kick off. Uh, first ever job. First ever job. I was a swim teacher after swimming for over 12 years from primary to high school. Nice. Decided to pick it up around 16. Um, but a lot of those years 
I had to go through COVID, so missed out on teaching, did it a little bit after high school and then um, eventually left it when I got to uni. Nice. And V, what are you studying at university? Yeah, I'm currently in my first year of studying journalism and communications, minoring in politics, um, but eventually hoping to work in sport media. I'm studying just down the road at RMIT. Awesome. And your, your favourite sporting moment? Maybe uh, outside of the FIFA World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a diehard, diehard Doggies fan, so I grew up just indoctrinated into the club, yeah. into the sport. Mum works at the club with the Community um, Foundation. Oh, yeah. do a lot of great stuff as well, so... Um, have been a massive support of them and all of the community work they do. But favourite sporting moment just had to be the 2016 grand yeah. final. I was a little 12, 13-year-old all the way up in level four. Um, but any seat in that stadium that day was yeah. just incredible. Nice. Amazing. And what is one book or podcast you would recommend that's helped you with your career so far? Would it be funny to say this one? <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been the biggest help. No, that's, that's totally okay. <laughs> Yeah, just a shameless plug. Yeah, just make it clear. Um, we haven't asked you to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, just as a uni student as well. So I started off doing an arts degree, not really being sure of what I wanted to go into, whether that be sport media or journalism. Um, but having listened to, I think it was Kat Lochnan's podcast from Fox, she had such great insights in hearing how, you know, she moved down from Perth to Melbourne. Now she's just one of like the premier news readers, journalists on the network and women in sport as well, just super inspiring. Nice. Well, that's good to hear. It's, uh, we definitely did not ask you to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kath would love that as well. And she'd be listening as well. So shout out to you, Kath. Um, and finally, if you had 30 minutes to pick someone's brain, who, who would it be? Oh, I've thought about this. It would either be Susie Wolf, who is, I think, the current director of F1 mm. Academy, the female branch of F1 yeah. um, or motorsport at the moment. She used to be a driver as well and she's married to Toto Wolf. So she's just incredible being a pioneer for women in motorsport and she's developing and changing the game. So it would be interesting to pick her brain, sort of the business side of things as well. Mm. And as a professional athlete, I think that's pretty cool. And the other would have to be Tracy Holmes from the ABC, sports journalist. I actually got to meet her or see her briefly interact at the FIFA Women's World Cup down in the media centre, just see her walk through the doors every day and fangirl a little bit. Nice. Um, such a good experience, though, meeting all of my favourite journalists and now networking and having some of their contacts just yeah. on LinkedIn in the contact book, which is amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Love that. That's awesome. Are you, you going to follow up any of them from grab a coffee? Yeah, uh, there's this journalist named Marnie from The Age who we aren't really meant to interact with all the press, but I just had to stop her when I saw her. Um, told her I was a fan of her work or I loved reading her work. Um, got into contact and she had in turn read some of my stuff and um, suggested wow. I suggest sorry suggested I pitch to The Age and um, all these other publications. So nice. a couple of things in the works, but yeah, no, just seeing how coming up to someone you know, telling them you admire your work, their work, um, sharing what you're doing and seeing how invested and interested they are in turns as well. Um, I guess like that's sort of the backbone of networking, but nice. it all works out. Awesome. That's so cool. Cause people, often, people often look at a tournament like this and think, oh, yeah, I'll get some cool experience, I'll volunteer and get something onto my resume. But you can never predict all the different opportunities that come off the back of that. So it's really cool to hear that. Once you're inside the vicinity of the FIFA Women's World Cup, you just you've made the most of all these other people being nearby. And I think the best thing is you don't go in expecting it. Mm. It sort of just comes around organically and naturally when you're working in sport. Everyone's sort of connected, and when they're sort of aware of your story as a uni student or your aspirations, they tend to, I guess, empathise and resonate with you. And so it's really nice that the sporting industry, although at times people can make it seem very saturated or competitive, everyone's sort of there supporting you as well. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like when you, um, you know, if you had gone into that with super high expectations being like, oh, you know, I've, I've got to meet all these people, I've got to introduce myself, like you probably would have, you know, it would have been more daunting to do it. But because you've just gone in thinking, you know, if anything happens here, fantastic, that probably enabled you to just jump in and, and do that off the bat, you know. So... Have no expectation. That's one of our networking tips as well uh, for meetups and, and networking events. So that's good. Mm, absolutely. 
Awesome stuff, V. Well, let's dive in. I'm really keen to hear more about the tournament. Um, you touched on it briefly a bit then, but could you just explain uh, to listeners what your role was during the tournament and could you tell us a bit about what your day-to-day was like maybe pre-tournament and during the tournament? Yeah, so my role was a media operations and broadcast volunteer. We had a team at about 20 people. Um, including volunteers and media officers. And obviously in sport, no two days look the same when you're working. But a day-to-day walk-in, check-in, and you've got your match days and your non-match days. So non-match days basically entail doing everything media-related on training days. So some teams will be headed down to the stadium and they do all of their pre-match press conferences and their training and they familiarise themselves with the grounds as well. So you're facilitating tickets accreditation for the media to actually access the field or the press conferences and the mix zones. Um, And then on match days, you come in around three hours before, set up the media centre, make sure all of the tech is fine, ready to go, um, set up the press room, the media tribunes as well. And the rest of the day is just being stationed at one of uh, the places I mentioned before. So the field of play, um, press conference, mix zone, up in the media tribune, Either way, you get to watch the match, you get to enjoy it as well. Um, But pretty much just making sure that media are complying um, with everything in terms of legal uh, broadcast rights, Um, making sure that they aren't, for example, recording players as well or being too invasive. Um, But, yeah, no, just making sure that they're getting everything they need to adequately cover the match Um, and you get to enjoy it just helping out. So did you literally, like, your... You literally have to like set up microphones and stuff, like make sure that everything's there. You know, there would have been sponsors that you have to set up there as well. Like, is it literally that deep? Yeah. So you've got some people who set up all the sponsorship stuff, but in terms of interpretation, microphones, um, mm. your media officer or our direct supervisors are the ones who are actually mediating the press conferences. So just making sure that's all ready to go for them as well. You've got two volunteers in the press room who are handing out the microphones to the journalists as well. So you're sort of giving them oh, yeah. a voice and. Um, allowing them to ask the questions and yeah, yeah. create their stories from there. One, one thing I came across recently when I was in Paris V was uh, the allocated zone for photographers at the Para World Athletics Championships. And um, the contact who I knew there, uh, she was head of the broadcast operations. And basically her role was to make sure that the media weren't going anywhere that they weren't. Did you notice this? At Amy Park, where you were, were there photographers trying to get places to get the best shot where they shouldn't have? Did you have to try and keep people at bay? Was there anything like that you had to deal with? Yeah, going into it, our media officers did warn us that Australia hadn't experienced an event to this scale. And so obviously media operations for a day-to-day AFL match are completely different. They're allowed Mm. to move around the ground at the G, let's say, whereas at Amy Park, You've got two sides of the ground. Your photographers have to stay there in their seats. They aren't even allowed to get up um, when someone's scoring a goal. So it's really funny. To round them up, we've got a rope and you basically heard them like sheep um, (laughs) making sure that they stay within those bounds um, when the players come out so that they can take their photos during the anthems and whatnot um, and then just herding them back to their sides of the ground and making sure that they stay in their seats They've got tickets for those specific seats on the pitch as well. So um, as long as they, I guess they're allowed to move around, um, but no arguments. Most of the photographers, I think, by the second, third match were pretty well accustomed to the processes and the rope's a little bit daunting for them. I think a lot of them were questioning, you know, why why there was so much effort and security around it. But it is an international event, so I think eventually they did understand. Yeah. I think I think it's amazing the the journo's get mics. I don't know if you you listen to AFL press conferences. Yeah. You can never hear the question. Yeah. I feel like people hate that. It's like you know, for FIFA, it's like no, nah, we do it, we do it right. Yeah. There's actually someone there to hand out microphones. Yeah, they have the live broadcast. Um, the only thing with the microphones is so your media officer will tell you who to allocate it to, but you uh, can't control what comes out of a journalist's mouth. So yeah. once you give them that microphone, you have to be ready to sort of revoke it straight away. And there are a couple of moments during the tournament where there were some, I guess, controversial questions. Um, yeah. One of the press conferences I actually sat in. And just hearing the dynamic in the room shift feels a bit shocking. Yeah. Um, But no, just really cool to see how the media operations officers, supervisors manage those sort of situations Mm. as well with the journalists. Yeah, nice. Is there um, anything in particular that you learnt from uh, those 
media officers or, or higher ups in the media and communications team? I think that, um, I mean, working for FIFA seems so prestigious and so high up, but my main FIFA media officer, she actually started off as a volunteer, I think, back in 2014 for FIFA as well. And slowly she graduated, got her communications degree, started working her way up and working in leagues such as the Euros. Um, and so this tournament, she worked Qatar last year as well. Mm. But yeah, she started 10 years ago as a volunteer and 10 years later she's out here mediating press conferences, you know, liaising with and controlling um, all of the legal rights and, you know, contacting players, making sure their media teams are um, sort of following the schedules as well. Wow. Gee, that shows, you know, literally where you are now. It's like you've just volunteered at the tournament. Mm. Who knows what's going to happen in 10 years' time, you know. And the people you meet as well, mm. it's just going to lead you right to where you want to get to. Um, tell, us a about, tell us a little bit about how you actually landed the position. Yeah, so it was advertised, I think, in the server back in December, which is when I would have joined SportsGrad. I was actually doing another internship at the time as well, but thought I might as well apply for it. So the server being the uh, Discord server for those who aren't aware. Yeah, just on the job board posts. Um, just went for it, applied. I think a month later, either December, January, they held group interviews. So just randomised groups, getting to know who you are, background checks and whatnot. Um, and it did take a while for them to get back, but eventually they assign you your roles. You have a preference basically into which workforce you want to be allocated to. So I had media operations as my first preference and I was lucky enough to get it. Um, and then they send you training modules the next couple of months. They roll it out until July. You go yeah. pick up your uniform, do your induction, super fun. And then you just sort of get nice. straight into it. My first shift was a game day. So sort of thrown into the deep end, not really sure what to do, but when you're on the job, you pick it up really quickly. Yeah. Um, and the media operations team are just incredible. So. Yeah. What's, uh, what's your advice with uh, group interviews? I had, I had someone ask me this the other day, like what, what's some tips for a group interview? I think it just depends. I think reading the dynamic, being able to yeah. read the room as well, because I know a lot of people do recommend that in group interviews you do sort of take the initiative to step up but it's also showing that you're receptive yeah you're a good listener um asking questions i think is a big one yeah. but i think i'm lucky the fifa dynamic was very welcoming i think we had about three questions each um and a couple of the other members had gone through their interviews and were i guess good enough to share what the questions were going to be so it gave <laughs> us a little bit of a heads up um but yeah no super friendly i think group interviews are just mainly to get to know, yeah. you know if you'd be a good fit in that environment. So nice. as long as, I mean, you're cooperating, I think there's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah. so were, you, were you chatting with other sports grad members who were going through the interview process at the FIFA Women's World Cup and everyone was just sharing the process and the insights with each other? Yeah, I can't remember which chat it was. It might have been like the Ask um, Sports Grad chat. But people were just sharing the questions, sort of how they approached them, how they answered them. No wrong answers, but it was just really nice to sort of have that prefacing guide as well for me. Um, interview went smoothly, but yeah, no, just appreciative that that was also there to brief me. That's Gosh. outstanding. I'm glad that that's got shared around. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's not cheating. It's just literally talking about it, right? <laughs> no, exactly right. Exactly. And, and V, when you got the job, do you remember where you were and how you reacted? Who did you tell first that you were going to be working on the FIFA Women's World Cup? Might have been at uni. <laughs> Most <laughs> days I'm at uni. Um, just message the friends. It's funny because I think a lot of the marketing for the FIFA Women's World Cup back then hadn't ramped up yet. So a lot of them were like, oh, there's a Women's World Cup in our city. I'm like, come on, guys, get on it. Um, but, yeah, no, I was just super excited. A lot of my friends aren't really into football, but even just seeing the development and the evolution of women's football now, you know, they're headed down to Fed Square mm. every week to watch and they're so into it as well. So seeing how it's just captivated so many audiences, I reckon this tournament will be a major turning point for women's football in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's crazy, isn't it? Like, you know, not on the weekend, I, you know, I went to the pub with four or five mates to watch the game and it's like... It's just incredible. You, you looked around, nowhere, you couldn't get a seat. It was just absolutely chockers. And it was just crazy. It just felt like 
it, it, it does feel like there's been a shift, mm. 100%. Like everyone used to get around the Socceroos and this just feels, you know, like the same. It's the World Cup, you yeah. know, and everyone's around it. Mm. Everyone's involved. It's just, it's incredible. So it definitely does feel like there's been a shift, even though like I feel like, you know, when there are women's tournaments in different sports, everyone's like, this is going to be the catalyst to change. And I mm. feel like sometimes, you know, that doesn't get acted upon it straight away. Yeah. And I think like this tournament especially just feels like this is just going to keep rolling, mm. which is which is unreal. So, And yeah. that last game against France was the most broadcasted or watched, um, I guess, sporting program in Australia mm. for the past two decades yeah. since Cathy Freeman's um, gold medal run. So I yeah. think that speaks volumes in itself. Yeah, yeah. Mm. totally. So we're recording this on the Monday, a couple of days after the Matildas have just made the semifinals of the World Cup. V, before you, before, uh, you joined the FIFA Women's World Cup, you would have had no idea how far the Matildas would go, given what they've done so far and hopefully continue to do. Has that changed how you feel around this piece of work, work experience you've been fortunate enough to be a part of? It has, I think... You know, as a spectator, like every Australian feels as though they're along for the ride. But knowing that you've been a part of that tournament as well, um, being up close and personal with the players and just being in those press conferences, you really feel as though you're living that story with them. Um, before the tournament, I was a soccer fan, but I'm more of an AFL girl. <laughs> so yeah. um, just the fact that football's consumed my entire life now and uh, it just feels like you're there with them. Um you just want to see them do well. Yeah, totally. Amazing. Well, V, after uh, you wrapped up your tournament, I saw a post come out on LinkedIn from, uh, from your profile saying, what a wonderful time you've had. And uh, one of your senior colleagues by the name of Dave Colbert, who some people might know Dave Colbert as the Channel 7 commentator. Every Olympics, every four years, he gets Best. brought in with his athletics background. Um, v, you might not know this, but I did my very first internship with Dave as well at the wow. University Olympics in Taipei. Um, we were working together on broadcasting that event and because I was the intern at the time, he created a little segment called Taste of Taipei. And so the intern being me was put in a position to taste 21 different foods in this night market in Taipei and they would just fill my reactions to eating all these wind wonderful things. Anyway, the point is Dave Colbert is a very senior figure in sport in Melbourne. And uh, he commented on your post saying, V, you did a tremendous job, which is outstanding praise to receive from someone like Dave. Now, I believe one of the things that you do regularly that keeps you on top of your day, on top of things daily, is uh, a daily diary and a vision board. And I was wondering for other people who might want to make the same progress you've made in your career, can you explain what the use of each of these looks like and how has each of them made a difference in your success within this role at the World Cup? Yeah, well, I think both the vision board and the daily diary keep a sense of accountability because we know that motivation isn't always, you know, um, a flowing source so just having something that details you know day to day what you're going to do but not being too strict with it um I did my VC throughout COVID and so just having a daily agenda really helped me to tick off and make sure that I was sort of following through all the things I needed to get done um the vision board I think just captures or encapsulates sort of where you want to be beginning of the year and then the end as well um the most important part is sort of keeping it open and being open to obviously add to it, redact from it and change it because especially working in sport and media, um, it's not a very linear pathway. Things can change very quickly as well. So I think my vision board beginning of the year was just to tick off an internship or to volunteer mm. in sport, which I've managed to do both by August. Incredible. Um but yeah, no, just having the goals there, having an outline. I know Sam Hickson a couple of episodes ago said he had sort of a 10-year plan, um, which is something that I've sort of wanted to establish as well. But just yeah. taking it year by year and having that long-term vision to sort of keep you accountable um, and just uh, making sure you've got that, um, I guess, goal to keep you accountable. Mm. Yep. So do you write in that in the morning or is that like a nightly thing? or um, In the morning. Yep. So wake up 
have a diary, just look at the vision board, um, and usually they sort of align um, with each other. Just have my daily tasks as well, make sure to schedule in some breaks. Um, But yeah, no, just little things which will sort of hopefully eventually lead to ticking off one of those goals on that greater vision board. Nice. That's awesome. Love it. Have there been any significant changes to your vision board this year? And after the tournament, are there any new things on your vision board or things you've taken off? Yeah, I think after the tournament, I've just been more motivated than ever to actually sort of land a permanent role in sport. At the beginning Mm. of the year, I was sort of open to, I guess, exploring different avenues of journalism, whether that's like cultural studies, um, hard news reportage, but after sort of immersing myself in that World Cup experience and earlier working for Ministry of Sport, that sort of allowed me to dip into a different avenue um, in terms of sports business as well. Mm. So just being more open to the opportunities in the sporting industry um, to hopefully this time next year securing, a f- I guess, some form or capacity um, job in sport. Nice. It looks like you're right on the way. Well, I need August, so... Yeah. Hey. And you got Unisport as well coming up? Yeah, I've just started my Unisport internship last week with them. So doing all of the social media, digital media, uh, journalism, all of the engagement leading up until September's nationals. So flying up to the Gold Coast, which is really exciting. Never nice. flown anywhere by myself as well. So um, awesome. to be paid to sort of work as a uni student in an yep. internship is just incredible. Yeah, nice one. No, that's fantastic. And I mean, we did say before we didn't ask you to talk about sports grab, but how did the community help with that? And obviously you joined, or was it sort of earlier in the year? Uh, um, what sort of, you know, made you join and, and, and what have you got out of it so far? Yeah, I'd been floating around sports grad for the past couple of months before I joined. I'd seen the ads and sort of heard from other people in the community. Um, Decided to join in December, which is when I actually swapped unis as well and was more decisive about wanting to get into media and journalism, Mm. but Mm. but not really knowing where to start and not having sort of a basis of contacts at all as well. Um, I think the most important thing is just having that supportive community, being able to ask anyone um, at any time a question, no matter how sort of stupid or simple it might sound. Um, And as a uni student as well, just having industry professionals, but also other uni students and people in your position sort of working together and sort of uplifting each other. um, It's really nice having that expertise from a lot of people who are actually working in the Mm. roles that you want to get into as well. And again, on the empathy point, I think that's a big thing in sport that it might be daunting and scary to reach out to someone who's already working as a professional in the industry. But most times they do look at you and, you know, maybe 10 years before they were in your exact position. And so most of the time they're willing to help. Yeah, amazing. And if you've got any friends who know of sports grad or ask you, you know, what's it like being a member? What's your experience like being a member? You know, what happens week to week, month to month? What, what, what do you tell them you get out of being a member? Just so many opportunities, I think, even if it's not like overtly jobs that are posted, um, opportunities to connect with other people, um, share some of your career goals as well. That keeps you accountable. Even the little wins, which are always celebrated, which is always nice. Um, it's funny, one of my friends just sent a screenshot from a sports grad ad. It was of a recent reel, I think, from working at the FIFA Women's World Cup. Um, you know, just a screenshot of me being in it. They're like, oh, this is interesting. Like you're on a sports grad out on Instagram. But yeah, no, just such a good community to be a part of. So it's like a, a rite of passage if you remember. You, you you do get seen on social media pretty pretty often. So <laughs> maybe that maybe we should say if you remember, you will be on social media in some capacity throughout your time with us. But no, that's good. Well, the ones the ones that do well and end up working in sport everywhere yeah. we love sharing their success so it's uh yeah hard not to <laughs> yeah um is there a particular new relationship that you've you've built since joining i know there's so many little uh you hear so many stories of people you know becoming mates and, and whatever through you know meeting on our online events or meetups or just literally on discord or whatever it might be um has there been any particular people you've got to know really well I think the FIFA Women's World Cup also enabled me to strengthen and actually get to know some of the members in real life, Pranav, Billy, just bumping into them on shift all the time as well, which has been pretty incredible. Um, 
Andrea, who was in my media operations team as well. So just, you know, the amount of members you bump into in real life, I know you just introduced <laughs> that into the Wild channel on Discord as well. Um, but no, it's funny seeing just how many people have sort of the same career directions, goals as you um, and meeting them in real life, actually getting to work with them. So good. Yeah, so supportive. I reckon Pranav and Billy are the new best mates in sports grad <laughs> groups. Of uh, there's a lot of content out there, a lot of chat. Uh, so that's the new new best buddies of sports grad, I reckon. Yeah, well, that in the wild channel has, has gone nuts. Uh, we didn't really think about it strategically, but starting <laughs> during the FIFA Women's World Cup was almost a perfect time to do it because there were you know yeah. thirty forty members out there seeing each other every day. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just, yeah, you, you can claim that one as well. That was a that was like a thirty to second, thirty second decision. I was like, let's mm. make this channel good in the wild, and no. now it's <laughs> popped off. So yeah, you can, you can take that. Mate. Well, I think I bumped into someone. I think I bumped into a. Uh, it must have been Garth Towen over in Switzerland, and I was like, I want to share this, but it's not really work share because we're just catching up. Where, where do I put this? <laughs> Hang on, you know, you're creating this thing. You yeah. should probably just find us what to. To put yeah. it so, we, so we built it and uh and off yeah. it went um but that's awesome yeah. to hear v um the community at the moment um is closed for the time being and for anyone who wants to, to join the wait list and grab one of those limited spots when we open up for our next intake um there's a spot on our website where they can jump and do that but for v for anyone who's thinking about joining the sports grad community is there anything that you would say to them i think um, the good thing about sports grad is that um, it sort of just welcomes and encompasses everyone from any different background. Doesn't matter whether you're, you know, five, ten years into your career in sport or just starting out. Um, very cliche, but just I think go for it. Um, yeah, no, just the opportunities and sort of the connections and networks that you sort of reap from it are very worth it. Um, it is very hard to sort of go out on your own and to navigate the sporting industry. So to have a point of, um, I guess, contact with people directly there, um, I think joining would be worth it from that. Nice. What, what's some advice, you know, because a lot of people want to just finish uni and go just get paid straight away into a full-time job. Like you, you're volunteering, you've done internships, like, you know, you're still going through that process. What, what's some advice for people who, you know, haven't looked at volunteering internships yet that is kind of fixated on that that job at the end? Like is any advice for those those guys coming through? Yeah, I think it's a bit sort of like narrow-sided to look straight into the paid avenue. Um, Ruben posted something on LinkedIn, I can't remember verbatim what it was, but it was sort of saying that, um, you know, People may question the amount of volunteering or unpaid hours that you do, but mm. in the long run, that builds up sort of your perspective, um, your empathy and your experience to actually getting a job in sport and your employees do appreciate all of the grassroots and the volunteering work that you do. Um, but just connecting with people sort of at a grassroots level, those sort of set up the foundational skills for you to work in sport. Mm. Um, I know I sort of started like that initially as well. I've been doing volunteer programs with the Western Bulldogs Community Foundation since I was 16. So I was lucky enough to have that pathway sort of paved for me really early on. And I yeah. enjoyed doing community work. I think a lot of people think it's either laborious or not worth it a lot of the time, but you tend to learn more actually being out in the field, doing that volunteer work than you would mm. in um, sort of any other sector or sort of going straight into a paid role and not really knowing what to expect in sport. Um, but, you know, every sort of level of sport um, has the same sort of values um, and that experience just at a lower level will help you when you do want to work in, let's say, like elite sport. Yeah. What have you found like from huge tournament like the FIFA Women's World Cup compared to like, you know, yearly volunteering for the Bulldogs? Like what's the difference there? Because I can imagine this one, you're kind of just cramming all this stuff into one, whereas like the Bulldogs, you probably learn a lot of things over a long period of time. Mm. Um, you know, what, what have you preferred to, to do? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly that. Um, they're both very fast paced environments, but with a tournament at an international scale, you do tend to pick up a lot more. 
um, and especially with media and broadcast operations having to deal with uh, people from all different walks of life, um, from all over the globe as well, you tend to pick up um, particularities with how they approach, let's say, media operations. Um, whereas volunteering with, let's say, the Western Bulldogs, you do learn a lot, but there's a lot more, I guess, time to engage and really get to know the programs and the people you're interacting with. Yeah. Um, a lot more in fleeting encounters with FIFA. You know, you might encounter a journalist and mm. make that connection with them, but not see them until, you know, the next time you're working in an international event, whereas with the Western Bulldogs, you're based in Australia, but you do form those connections um, to a deeper level, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, so both meaningful, but I think with... Uh, yearly volunteer programs, you have sort of more space to really develop hone in your skills um, and your experience throughout the year. Yeah, awesome. Amazing. And V, what's, what's next for you? Is there any other, you mentioned the, uh, the nationals coming up, but uh, in terms of um, skills or strings to your bow that you're looking to, to build on, what, what are you trying to grow within yourself? I think within like journalism, media, just upskilling. I know communications, PR, media are all sort of lumped into one these days. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not the best with sort of the digital media video side, which is something that I've brought up uh, with my supervisor, Kylie, who works at Unisport, um, to hone in on that in addition to my journalistic writing skills. So just making sure I think that sets you apart as well, making sure I'm well-rounded with the social media engagement marketing side, which actually makes sure that your content and your journalism has an audience and has a reach mm. and ultimately an impact. So I think just encompassing all of those skills around uh, digital media um, is something that I'm really trying to work on. Nice. So specifically like using Premiere Pro to cut up clips and create social media content? Yeah, uh, exploring different digital contents as well, um, you know, X, threads, um, sort of navigating and... It's hard to keep <laughs> up, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Just had to think about it for a moment there. Yeah. Um, but just familiarising myself with the different platforms, their functionalities, and again, making sure that your content actually does reach your targeted or desired audience. Hmm. How do you upskill in that? Um, no, I was just going to say, like, hmm. you know, in order to learn... How they all work? Like, is there a set? Is this something you you read, or is it more just time on the app, or is it just looking at what other people are doing yeah, to see how they use it? A mix of everything. I know LinkedIn has a couple of courses which sort of break down different platforms and different programs, um, but sort of just stalking the work of people who actually work in sports media as well yeah. and seeing what they're putting out, the different niches that they're targeting. Um, TikTok's a big one as well, which we were talking about at Uni Sports. So sort of trying to capitalise on that because that's just been massive for sports media and we've seen so many uh, different leagues and codes sort mm. of interact and engage new audiences from platforms like TikTok. So um, being on the apps themselves as well, actually knowing how to use it yourself, um, <laughs> yeah. understanding the algorithms. Um, but, yeah, it's a lot of, I think, self-initiative into learning those mm. things because uh, your unis oftentimes they won't sort of teach you how to use social media or find uh, the ways around it. So um, just sort of seeking out those courses, reading yeah. and uh, taking inspiration from other people who are actually working. Them. Yeah. Well, v, how much time do you have on your hands at the moment? Because that's exactly what we do and we're always <laughs> looking for a bit of help. So <laughs> if you're interested, do you want an internship? <laughs> yeah. Not sure. Wait, really? Yeah. Are, yeah. Sorry. Are we doing this? <laughs> yeah, this? This wasn't part of the plan, but yeah, hearing you talk about what you want to get better at is exactly what we do. And you would have spoken yeah. to Pranav. That's the work that he does at the moment with, with Yash and, and Millie. And um, no, we'd, we'd always welcome new people to come and help us out with the socials. So um, yeah, have you got some time? Yeah, it's so down. I thought you were joking. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no we, we give internships live on the podcast. Oh, <laughs> we do now. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Take another one off the vision board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, in all honesty though, that is exactly what Pranav and, and Yash are doing. So yeah. you don't have to answer right now on the podcast, <laughs> but uh, the offer is there. I mean, if you do want to answer now, you can. That would be oh, really amazing. good content. But um, yeah, yeah. Come, come and join the team. And it, 
I'm always looking for new friends here in Melbourne. My my comrades overseas until November, so I always need friends in the oh, office. Man. So yeah, appreciate that, guys. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll we'll let you sit on that mm. uh, and come back to us. But uh, it has been absolutely awesome having you on. Um, and like we said at the very start, you know, we love getting our members on. Um, and, you know, I know you're a little bit like, why am I on here for a bit there? But I think it's just fantastic seeing your journey. And you, yes, you are, you're early on, but you're doing some extraordinary things that not a lot of people are, are doing at this at this stage of their career. So um, one of our very favourite members, you're an absolute star. So thanks for coming on and, and good luck on the Gold Coast. We might, might see you up there as well. Thank you. Awesome. Guys, it's time now for the People's Segment, Ask Sports Code, where every week we answer a question directly from our community. If you'd love to ask a question, first become a Sports Code member at sportsgrad.com.au slash community, and then you can add your question to the channel named Ask Sports Grad. Rubes, this comes from Jack, and, and he says, how do I update my LinkedIn custom URL? Well, I love LinkedIn questions. They're good. Yeah, great question, Jack. And uh, this is uh, one that is uh, it's a little one percenter. We've got a bunch of LinkedIn one percenters that make a big different difference to your profile, and just by making these changes, make you appear as a clean, confident, uh, sophisticated user of uh, LinkedIn, as we as we say. <laughs> I love that. And um, <laughs> so, so the reason why you want to do this is because if you create a LinkedIn profile, it'll spit out a random URL. And it'll have your name and it'll have about 17 random letters and numbers at the end of it. And it's just long and it's messy. And it means anytime that you want to copy and paste it anywhere, it looks long and messy. And now the reason why you might want to copy and paste it somewhere is, for example, if you were to put it on your resume, which I have got it on mine. I've had it on my resume since university. And um, it's just an easy way for you to link your online presence to your to your resume. And but if you link that to your resume with about 17 random letters and numbers at the end of it, it just looks messy, it's taken up half the page, it looks silly, and it looks unprofessional. So if you're going to be sharing your URL around like this, you've got to clean it up. And trust me, it makes a difference because when we had HR manager Daniel Simons on the podcast, who's the uh, director of people and culture at the Victorian Institute of Sport, he said, if you can't format your resume correctly, how can I trust you to do high quality work or to give a great presentation when you can't do the little things like tidy up your resume. So people notice this stuff. Yeah. Now the way to do it is very, very simple. If you go to your LinkedIn profile, click on settings, go to custom URL, you will find it all there. And simply just change it to your name. I think Ryan, yours might be like Ryan Walker 95 or something like that. I think yeah. mine is uh, Ruben JW. So something short and spiffy that, it, that um, that uh you know is clearly you presents well on paper and uh and it's just that little one percent that can make a big difference yeah 100 percent. i i think it's it's crucial it, it looks so messy you've just got a random url i don't know sorry for those people who have a random url but this is your reminder to fix it um so this is just a yeah the the one percenters count and they matter so this is just one of those small things to to get on top of Brilliant. Well, if you'd like to ask us a question or ask our friends in sport a question, sign up and become a member today. Each fortnight, we jump on Q&As, speed networking, job fairs, you name it, and it's your opportunity to ask industry professionals any of your burning questions. And all these sessions are recorded, so you can go back and have a look at those in our exclusive content hub, which is uh, amazing. It's packed. There's hours of content in there, so it's all for you to explore. In the meantime, find us on LinkedIn. Give us some love with a rating if you enjoy the show. Subscribe on Apple or follow us on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey, guys. One last thing before you go. If you'd enjoy a quick email from us each Friday on all the latest job openings, networking events, Q&As with industry professionals and latest podcast episodes, then subscribe to the Sports Grad newsletter. Head to our website, www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's also a link in our show notes to join.